Good morning. My name is Caitlin Simpson, and I have the privilege of serving on staff here at First Christian Church. I serve our children, families, and young adults. Most Sundays, you can find me downstairs serving our youngest disciples. But in 2013, I began serving First Christian Church as a seminary intern, and thus began the journey of preaching on this Sunday, the Sunday after Christmas, so that Brian, our senior pastor, could take a much needed post-Advent break. But it's an interesting task to try and figure out what to say on this Sunday, the transition from one year to the next. Because I have to try to figure out how much time do I spend reflecting on the year that we're about to leave behind? How much time do I spend looking ahead to the year that awaits us? It's such a delicate balance, trying to figure out what to say. And perhaps, like me, many of you have spent time reflecting on the year that is behind us, the things that have brought us overwhelming joy, the trials and the tribulations, the memories we've made, and the ones that we wish had never come. Perhaps, like me, some of you are looking ahead to what 2018 has to hold for us. Perhaps, like me, some of you are wondering, when we think about 2017, what if we say, was it enough? Was any of it enough? When we think about the things that we have accomplished, the things that we can check off on the list, was it enough? Was any of it enough? Because we live in a do more, have more, be more society. It's a constant battle of balancing excess, of making sure that whatever we post on Facebook or Insta Instagram accurately reflects our perfected lifestyles. Not of the rich and famous, no. Of making sure that whatever we post is an accurate depiction of a sort of messy mystique that perfect reflection of what it means to sort of humble brag about our lives. The adventurous excursions we take, the precarious situations we get ourselves into, our cuddly, furry companions and the crazy things they do, the messy lives they lead, or our children or grandchildren and the adorable and curious things they do or our humble yet lavish excursions that we take. Or maybe we're the ones who just post everything, the sort of word vomit. We know who we are. And if we aren't posting, well, we are a people on the move. Extracurricular activities are not just for children anymore. Because if you're a parent or a grandparent, you are carting children to events and clubs and activities and sports events all the time, nonstop. It is a never-ending barrage of glitter and goop and games all the time. And don't worry, if you're not a parent or grandparent, you have plenty of events too. Because you have your own games and events and board meetings and fundraising and volunteering and all of these different things you have to attend and everything seems vital. We are busy. We have weddings and anniversaries and birthday parties and church meetings. And then we have to attend church every Sunday. We are busy, busy people. You know, recently I was listening to a sermon by one of my favorite theologians, Nadia Boltz Weber. Nadia is a Lutheran pastor out of Denver, Colorado. The church that she serves, they call themselves the House of Sinners and Saints. And in her sermon, she preached about this thing called sacred rest or Sabbath rest. Nadia defines sacred rest in a really interesting way. She says, sacred rest is a break 
from the am I productive enough, lovable enough, safe enough, thin enough, rich enough, strong enough, worthiness system we live under. The sacred rest that is yours never comes from being worthy. It never comes through adopting the right kind and the right amount and the right quality of spiritual practices. Nadia, as she talks about sacred rest in her sermon, she also discusses the idea of being busy, the sort of difficulty of being able to balance what it means to rest with this idea that we're so busy. She has this really interesting concept about busyness as well. In fact, she says that busyness is an American epidemic. Like children afraid of the dark who sleep with the lights on, we are perhaps terrified of what might reach out and grab us, what might make itself known in the unfilled space, so we layer on two or three things to fill every moment to make sure there isn't any. And even when we have so-called leisure time, we seem to have an endless stream of background noise. Facebook, Twitter, BuzzFeed, Instagram, podcasts, Netflix, and then back to Facebook to see if anything has happened in the five minutes since we last checked it. Has anyone liked something about me? Was something I said worthy of being shared? Maybe this busyness is just a way to justify our existence. And as I was listening to this sermon, I couldn't help but think, yeah, that feels a little close to home. And then I also thought, well, what if this busyness is also a sort of way to compete with one another? What if we sort of take pride in how busy we are? And Nadia went on to talk about that too, this sort of pridefulness in how busy we are. And so I kind of imagined a sort of gauntlet of busyness. Well, I'm busier than you are. I have 33 things to do tomorrow. And then you say, well, I have 48. And it's sort of volleying back and forth on Sunday mornings about how busy we are. And if it's not on Sunday mornings, well, maybe it's at holiday gatherings, trying to best Uncle Bob over Turkey about how busy we are. And if that's not what's happening, if it's not about being competitive about how busy we are, are we at the very least prideful about it? And if we aren't prideful, if we are just downright exhausted with the busyness of our lives, well, what are we doing to change it? Because I can't help but wonder, would we even know what to do if it weren't for the blindingly chaotic busyness of our lives? Would we have any idea what to do if it was just still? Sabbath rest. If I'm being honest, the whole idea freaks me out. I am not a good rester. I'm really bad at it. And frankly, I find it annoying. I am terrible at resting. I don't like taking time off. I judge people who ask me to do it. And vacation bores me. I am the person who gets up before sunrise every day on vacation. I seek out the sunrise. And then I need stuff to fill the day. I gotta have stuff to do. And most of the time that means I find work to do. I am checking email, I am responding to email, and if I can't find work to do, well, I'll make work. I will figure out something to do on vacation. And I'll stay up until the wee hours, and I might sleep a little bit, and then I'm up again before sunrise. Rest freaks me out. And my family, I think they, they like to sort of just chill and lay, lay out and relax. They want a nap, which I think is weird. 
You're wasting the day, people. We got stuff to do. And yet, God calls us to rest. And not just a few times a year when we get to go on vacation. But every single week, God calls us to rest. Are we owning that? Are we living into that with intention? Are we resting? Let's just try something here. Just, just go with it. I want us to just close our eyes. I want us to put our hands out with our palms up. I want us to just surrender to the moment. And I'm going to ask a question. And your answer is between you and God. There's no need to answer out loud. Sabbath rest. Am I living into that with intention? Am I owning it? The answer lies between you and God. You can open your eyes when you're ready. I can't help but wonder what we are missing when we plow through our lives. When we are too quick to turn the page. When I graduated seminary, I decided to treat myself in a most spectacular way. As a self-professed Harry Potter fanatic, I decided to reread the seven book series slowly, to savor it. Because I started reading that book when I was 11, the very first book. I was 11, Harry was 11, soulmates, it was perfect. I was gonna reread it slowly with intention savor it. And it was hard. I mean, I had to really slow myself down to prevent myself from flipping through those pages to get to the good stuff. Because I knew those books like No Tomorrow. I had read them probably a dozen times. But there I was, working the night shift at a shelter, and as my clients slept, I read. And several weeks later, as I finished that series, I sat in awe. A whole new respect for the series that I love so well because I had learned so many new things that I had never seen before. One major plot twist in particular that I had missed for over a decade that I'm actually pretty embarrassed to admit to the other Harry Potter fans in the room there's a, one of the main characters, spoiler alert, Neville Longbottom. His parents had been tortured by another character, Bellatrix Lestrange. And I always, after I read that, just assumed that they died. Just turned the page, kept going. Yeah, yeah, we get it. She's evil. But they didn't die. They lived. I had no idea. And I remember in the middle of the night, reading that section over and over, thinking, what has happened? They were alive. I was stunned. This series that I love so much, and there's this major thing that I had missed because I was too quick to turn the page. And I couldn't help but wonder what else had I missed? And just what does God have to say about it? In the book of James, chapter 4, it reads, Now listen, you who say today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why? Why? You do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. 
As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes. All such boasting is evil. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. It's interesting to me because it would appear that our affinity for looking ahead is not a new phenomenon. This idea of boasting for tomorrow, what appears it has transcended the test of time. In Bibles that break up sections with headers, the header for this section of James reads, boasting about tomorrow. But I can't help but wonder if for 2017, we might need to adjust this header just a little bit. If perhaps it should read instead, I'm just so busy. Because aren't we just so busy? Sabbath, rest. 2017 is about to leave us. Many of us are already looking ahead to 2018, wondering what it holds for us. Perhaps already anticipating what awaits us. The page is turning, and yet, I wonder, what if we just hold tight for the moment and savor it? I don't know if you've made resolutions. Maybe you're like me and you just get a little bit weary about making those resolutions, wondering if you can hold up to it. I get a little bit uneasy about making what I call deprivation resolutions. Those resolutions where you have to take something away. I'm going to give up this or that. I like to make resolutions where you get something. You add to your life. Sabbath, rest. Let us remember what Nadia has to say about it. The Sabbath rest that is yours and mine comes from the promise of the gospel. That Jesus came to save sinners. That Jesus came to heal and love and save the sin sick and the overfunctioning. That Jesus came to give rest to the weary and the restless. To give rest to the harried housewives and overworked social workers and mildly depressed executives. Sabbath, rest. Perhaps starting today, right now, in 2017, when we find ourselves saying, I'm just so busy, perhaps right now is the exact moment when we need to say, Sabbath, rest. Are we willing to seek out Sabbath rest with intention, to own it. I pray that we are. Amen. <laughs>